So now we will talk about uh, very general uh, concepts. So the introduction to artificial intelligence. I would like you to, to see also how deep learning is positioned within artificial intelligence and also repeat some very, very general uh, concepts from machine learning and artificial intelligence in general. So this is of course not maybe extremely important, but it's maybe good to know a little bit of history uh, to realize that deep learning is not an invention of last 10 years or so. Uh, so we can say that AI started in 40s, 50s, where there was the Manhattan Project and the scientists uh, such as uh, von Neumann or, or Ulam, they worked on uh, something like the, the foundations of AI. They proposed cellular automata. Uh, then in, in, in 40s, they, at the end of 40s, Shannon proposed information theory. So this is something that, you know, for computer scientists in general is uh, something like the basic language. And then Turing in 50s uh, laid out a lot of beautiful theorems and uh, concepts, including Turing test. Th then also McCarthy termed artificial intelligence. Rosenblatt proposed perceptron model and implemented it using uh, super old fashioned old school uh, computers. And we can actually say that in 50s, uh, this was the moment where deep learning uh, occurred, maybe without deep, it should be terms uh, uh, shallow uh, learning maybe, but this was the first uh, time that actually an, an artificial neuron was proposed. And then we had uh, some other ideas in AI like uh, evolutionary computing expert systems, uh, ELISA or ELISA was also some kind of this, uh, you know, first bot. Uh, and in 80s, actually, it was something that was extremely, extremely fascinating. That was called convolutional nets. It was called original neurocognitron, if I remember properly, proposed by Japanese scientist Fukushima. Uh, but in 82, so we can say that there was the first model that is nowadays used uh, as almost like a standard uh, uh, architecture for and uh, processing images. Then in 85, uh, Yuda Upper proposed Bayesian nets. And so he, he, he laid down foundations of probabilistic modeling uh, for more complex problems. Uh, and so we can say that in some sense, it's again show that, you know, we should look at networks uh, and we can maybe treat each node as a, a, a random variable. Then in the uh, seminal paper of Hummel Hart, uh, including uh, Jeffrey Hinton, the back propagation was uh, um, proposed or maybe not proposed as rather something like uh, written down more formally and um, also applied to neural networks explicitly. Uh, however, they still of course struggled with hardware and uh, they had to wait at least 10 years. And in, in mid 90s, uh, neural networks um, had a lot of successes because personal computers allowed the people to learn something more challenging and something useful. Uh, and uh, uh, it was a big boom, I would say, for neural networks. And then Vapnik and uh, Others, they proposed support vector machines and people were saying that, well, this is the end of neural networks. There are a lot of anecdotes that, uh, for instance, Vapnik uh, met uh, Jan LeCun and they were talking in a cafe. Uh, and they were, and Vapnik said that, you know, neural networks are passe. So it's something like we should focus on something different. Uh, but then uh, people, actually started thinking of some kind of special tricks that they could uh, use to, to learn better and in deeper architectures. And even in, 19, in 1997, uh, Seb Hochreiter and Jürgen Schmidhuber, they proposed uh, long short-term memory. So a very specialized recurrent neural network that was capable of learning longer dependencies in sequences. And it was 
something like a big step towards uh, deep learning. And we can say that from 2000 or 2005, six, there was this huge boom of deep learning era. And we will see now in this course that actually uh, a lot of work is done in the last one, two years. So this is the historical perspective. And uh, now we can say also why AI is successful, right? Because actually we have very accessible hardware. We can buy for, let's say 2000 euros, actually a laptop with a GPU and we can already train deep architectures. We have amazing uh, uh, intuitive programming languages like Python, for instance. It's almost like writing a pseudocode, right? And we have amazing packages like NumPy, like PyTorch, that allow us to use tensor calculus uh, to, to implement efficiently uh, our algorithms and models. So these two things together, these are extremely important. And in general, what we can say about uh, AI systems, so we need to, to figure out, of course, how we represent knowledge. So uh, how, because the knowledge representation will uh, indicate or will determine how we need to process also data. So for instance, uh, we can use a graph as our representation or we can use matrices and so on. The other thing is, how to, uh, how to uh, obtain some knowledge, so knowledge acquisition. So what is the learning objective? What kind of algorithms we should use to, to, to extract knowledge? And in the end, of course, we should say what kind of learning problems we have. Uh, and uh, these three things together, they are some like foundation of AI systems in general. And this is what we should be and um, should be aware of when we could deal with AI systems. If we talk about neural networks or deep learning, so our knowledge representation, uh, we can say that this is a set of matrices or set of tensors, so weights of neural networks. Uh, and we uh, use learning objective to be, as you will see, uh, uh, the likelihood function. And as our algorithm we will use uh, gradient-based methods mainly, uh, gradient-based methods that, uh, that is used to, uh, to, to learn these weights using some data. And of course, learning problems is what we will talk uh, in a second. But in general, these two points, we can think of uh, neural networks together with gradient-based optimization. And the learning problem, we can see it as an optimization problem and very specific one. So what does it mean? It means that we have some given data, we have uh, some family of, or a class of representation. So for instance, we can say that we have some images with labels like uh, dogs and cats or cats and, and horses. And we, we want to learn the best possible neural network, all right? And then we have some specific learning objective, for instance, the likelihood function. And we are looking for such weights for which I will have uh, the, the, the highest likelihood. So that uh, for this given data, my model is uh, best suited. And uh, very often we will say, instead of optimization algorithm, because to be honest, it's not very sexy, uh, we will say this learning algorithm. And why? Because it allows us to learn our model. And now we can uh, discuss what kind of learning tasks we have in general. And we, we can uh, distinguish some like three main tax, tasks. So the first task is supervised learning. So we have inputs and outputs, for instance, images and labels like horses and cats. Then we are mainly interested in prediction so what does it mean? It means that if I get a new image, I want to say what is the proper label for that. And what we do, we minimize some kind of prediction error expressed in some way. Uh, then we have unsupervised learning. And uh, in, un in the unsupervised learning paradigm, we don't make any distinction among variables. So we don't say this is input, this is output. No, we treat it as, you know, 
uh, one vector of variables. For instance, uh, we just look at the images and we say, these are, this is what we have. We don't have any labels. And we rather uh, focus on uh, looking for some structuring data. So what kind of patterns I have inside my data that you know, uh, are informative enough. For instance, we can say that, all right, I have uh, faces of people. And now the structure is that whether a person has glasses is you know, a lot or a, a few hair or, or something like a beard or no beard, uh, male, female, and so on. We can say that this is our structure now. And in general, we are looking for uh, minimizing some reconstruction error, compression, and so on. These all ideas uh, in compression, for instance, this is the part of this is part of unsupervised learning. And then the last uh, component or the last sorry uh, task is reinforcement learning. So now this the story is a little bit different. So before we had okay, I have images and labels, I, or I don't have labels. But right now we, we just distinguish uh, agent that is embedded in some environment. And by agent, I mean, uh, for instance, a robot walking in some, I don't know, uh, an, in an apartment. But I can also say that my agent is uh, a bot that's uh, a, a bidding bot that interacts with other uh, bidding agents people or machines and the whole environment is uh, I know internet and the platform that they can exchange their uh, bits and what we want to learn now is or what we are looking for is a policy and the policy is uh, uh, you can say some kind of strategy of making actions and making decisions and then after some time after a series of maybe actions, we, we get some rewards. We know whether we, we did what we wanted or not. For instance, uh, I can say that we have a robot, a Roomba or some other robot that is cleaning my house. And uh, I can click a button. Uh, the small robot is going everywhere and cleaning. And then at the end, I can, for instance, say, okay, nice, but 20% of my room is still dirty. So I can reward it, partially reward it. Uh, uh, and then maybe this, maybe this machine has some kind of learning algorithm and it, it can update it itself. And in general, we maximize some kind of a total reward. For instance, if I run multiple times, uh, I want that my reward is, uh, the total reward is maximized. So these are the three main problems. And for instance, what we can have we can have a classification error. So it's a classification problem where for a given image, I have some task. I can have regression problem when for a given image, I have some continuous value. For unsupervised learning, I can, uh, I can be interested in, for instance, grouping or clustering uh, some objects. And then in reinforcement learning, uh, I can imagine, for instance, some drones uh, flying around and coping with wind blows or something like that. Or uh, as I mentioned before, is cleaning vacuum robots that uh, maybe they encounter something new and they should learn how to do that or even video games, right? As you will see in this course, video games is some like favorite uh, favoring stuff of these big companies like uh, DeepMind or Google, Open AI, and so on. So these are the three main tasks. And now we will move to uh, to real introduction to deep learning. And the deep learning uh, introductory uh, slides, uh, we will start with more principled manner of looking at. Uh, let's say foundations of that. So we will start with, right, so now we will look into deep learning, but still from this introductory level, okay? We will say a couple of things why we want to learn deep neural networks and, and why this is important. 
So first of all, deep learning is used nowadays actually everywhere in computer vision, in information retrieval, speech recognition, NLP, uh, recommendation systems, and so on, drug discovery. All big players and all big companies, they have own researchers that work only with or on deep learning. So this is something like extremely, extremely uh, important uh, uh, topic. What are the something like the best applications? Uh, I, I will name only a few, but these are something that uh, is you know made the change in, in the field. So, uh, for instance, one application that really was extremely successful, where deep learning was extremely successful, was handwriting generator. So Alex Graves uh, proposed in his PhD thesis a recurrent neural network that was able to uh, generate a sequence by picking a style. So as you can see, it was, we have a, a neural network that is trained on different styles and depending on what style we want to achieve, it will generate any sequence that we want. Uh, for instance, other application is image generation. So uh, here it's uh, our very uh, recent uh, paper together with a uh, a master student, Yanis Katopoulos, that uh, graduated a month ago. Uh, so basically almost like you're a bit older uh, colleague. And uh, the project was about generating images. And on the right, you see that there is a variational autoencoder that generated, was trained on uh, faces of celebrities. And all these faces are totally fake. The, these faces do not represent anyone uh, like li living person. And then on the left and on the right, you can see a different models, different generative models that were able to not only generate faces in the end, but also for instance, sketches in the middle. So you can imagine that this was uh, something like, uh, uh, like you make a sketch of a person and then you put colors. So this was this generative process here, or it was more like compression-like uh, perspective that first you generate low quality images, then you uh, make higher quality images. And in the end, the, the, the original resolution of images. So as you can see, so there are different possible approaches and, 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 and this is where deep learning, especially these days, you will see in lecture six and seven and eight or 10, sorry, you will see that these models, these days, deep generative models are something like killing anything else. Uh, another really cool uh, application from a couple of years ago is uh, image captioning using deep learning by uh, Andre Karpathy and uh, Li Fei Fei. Uh, so they trained uh, a deep, uh, deep learning based uh, system that for given image, uh, provided uh, a short description, like, I don't know, for instance, the first one, a man in black shirt is playing guitar, right? So, yeah, this is, it, uh, it was also a breakthrough that uh, a neural network, a, an AI system is capable of understanding what's going on in, in these uh, images. And, uh, Another perspective that also maybe is useful and worth to realize is that uh, the, the core components of deep learning, they share a lot with standard machine learning uh, methods, but with something extra. And of course, models and algorithms, this is everywhere in AI, let's say. We have it in statistics, in uh, data mining or machine learning. But uh, what is something this distinct, distinct, distinct uh, uh, feature is that first of all, we have a lot of data these days, right? So uh, big data is something like a couple of years ago, it was a sexy term. Now it's uh, something like standard because people are aware that there's a lot of data. So uh, many mo models, in machine learning or statistics, they, they cannot cope with uh, big data. 
deep learning seems to be like a, a perfect match for that. Even open AI uh, people, they would say that, yes, we, we, we want more data. The more data we can get, the better and the better model we will get. And another, another thing that is extremely important, I mentioned that, but I, here I want to highlight it again. So this computational uh, aspect is the, another thing that is very, very specific for deep learning. When uh, people in machine learning, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago, they didn't bother too much about computational resources. Of course, the more, the better, faster, and so on, that it was more or less fine. But with deep learning uh, methods, we do care about it. And so people started thinking about parallel computing, GPUs, and so on, TPUs, FPGA at some point, also something like that. And they, of course, started developing deep learning frameworks to help people to develop uh, deep learning uh, models. And we have, at some point, there were Tiano, Cafe, Lasagna. So this is for, you know, historical, to, have it, to keep in mind from a historical perspective. And these days we have PyTorch and TensorFlow, right? The two main. Um, and also JAX that just came uh, one or two years ago. But this, these two elements, that uh, data and computational performance, this is something like really extra in deep learning. That this is this uh, very, very typical for deep learning to, to also be like uh, something a bit different than uh, other machine learning methods. And uh, what is the something like philosophy of deep learning? Uh, I would say this is very closely, tightly uh, related to representation learning. In general, representation learning, we can say that, you know, we want to uh, learn a set of possibly abstract features uh, that maybe we, we can't even name, but the, there is there in our data, or even features that we can uh, name, like, I don't know, whether a person wears uh, glasses or not, uh, I don't know, yellow shirt or not, right, and so on, so on, young, old, so this is the, some kind of representation, some set of features. And the, the, the big premise of deep learning is that it actually allows us to automatically extract features from data. So we can automatically learn some representation of our data. And each level, hidden layer we can call it, is some kind of abstraction uh, level. So for instance, here on this uh, slide, we have that there is uh, an image First, we learn some kind of very simplistic uh, features like some edge detectors. Then maybe we learn uh, parts of a face, right? And uh, there will be an eye and a very specific eye, smiling uh, uh, or not smiling, sad face and so on, so on. And then in the end, we'll combine this component on this part to get uh, something like uh, and uh, face prototypes or something like that. And then in the end, on top of that, once we have this, you know, abstract, uh, some generalized uh, faces, for instance, we can classify it and we can say, right, in this uh, uh, photo, I see a man in glasses. Uh, and some kind of uh, this pretty abstract, but objectives for learning features. So we would like that these features are informative, for instance, that we can easily discriminate or we can easily generate out of these features uh, that these uh, features are robust to some small perturbations or not maybe small in general, some transformations, right? And then we can say that we want to be invariant. So we, for whatever, if I instance, rotate my image, the output of uh, a neural network will be exactly the same. This is invariance or we want to have equivariant neural networks that if I rotate my image, a neural network, the output of neural network will also rotate, will follow the same transformation. And uh, representation learning, we can say that this is again, some kind of optimization algorithm, but here it's important that we have a specific representation. And in this case, we talk about neural networks. 